Welcome everyone to Revved Up for Sunday, another episode where we look at the gospel for the upcoming Sunday. Here we are, the clergy of St. Mark's Episcopal Church in New Canaan, Connecticut. I'm Elizabeth Garnsey. I'm Peter Walsh. I'm Justin Chris. Today we get one of the most time-honored and beloved parables in all of scripture. This comes from the Gospel of Luke, and it is the Good Samaritan. Uh, everything's happening on this road, and uh, there's something for everyone in this great, great story. So let's dive in. This is from Luke 10, verses 25 to 37. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of, the, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hand of the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. You're right. This is an incredible, incredible parable. And I remember uh, several episodes ago when we talked about the prodigal son and the parable of the prodigal son, the parable of the Good Samaritan being mm -hmm. Jesus's two most popular teachings. Uh, let me enter, and I'm going to enter in, not with the lawyer, but I'm just going to enter into to place or to put it in the context of Jesus's time. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it says here, uh, uh, when he tells the story that this man is going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Just talk about that for a second. So uh, uh, Jerusalem is at about 2,500 feet and Jericho is 700 feet below uh, below sea level. So in, in, in fact, this man is going down, much better be going down than be going up. Uh -huh. uh, it's about a 40 mile trip. So it takes about, it takes about 50 minutes in a big bus if you're, oh, wow. uh, if you're there today. Mm -hmm. And this road was a not notorious road, right? I mean, its nickname was the way of blood mm -hmm. because uh, there's so many twists and turns. And for those of you uh, who have been to the Holy Land, you may have seen the road. And when you see it, uh, oftentimes we're, we're sort of uh, up here and uh, it, it cuts as water has cut through time through the mountains and through the Judean desert. So it, it has these kind of uh, movements in it. It wasn't done by a bulldozer, right? It was not done by a straight line. It was clearly done by water uh, early, early on and you know, maybe in our Earth's history. But anyway, uh, it's a place where robbers can hide and whack you on the head with a mm -hmm. stick. And now we have uh, the Good Samaritan, which as we all know, I mean, that is so intended to provoke, right? The Good Samaritan, the, we can just say the good, anything you might, you might really detest. It would, uh, but just to say a word about the Samaritans and, uh, and the people, the, the Jewish people of, of Jesus's day. So the Samaritans and the Jews are, are all descendants from the Israelites, right? The mm -hmm. ancient Israelites. And they are, they are cousins with a mad disagreement over basically two things. One of those is the worship in Mount Zion, right? Where the temple is uh, in Jerusalem. And for the Samaritans, it's Mount Gerizim. And there's a disagreement over the scriptures. It's the same books, but it's a sort of the translations of what we might call the Torah. And the Samaritans saying that they have the, the purer Torah. And their disagreement is bitter. I mean, we see this played out through the scriptures, the woman at the well uh, in Samaria. 
And just finally, for the kind of way in, I must say that uh, during one of my trips to the Holy Land, I remember we were in Nablus, which is one of the West Bank cities, and we were driving along, and uh, the guide, Iyad, was sitting next to me, and he pointed out the window, and he said, that's Mount Gerizim. And I was like, that's Mount Gerizim? You know, <laughs> yeah. I, somehow, uh, anytime these biblical places that right. seem to have mythological mm -hmm. uh, power turn out to be real places. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, and we were uh, cutting through on a Friday morning, and there was not a person on the road. And just to say about, about the Samaritan peoples today, there are, there are Samaritans today. And they live greatly, they actually live greatly on the edge of Nablus and up on this mountain. And another hunk of them live uh, just below, sort of between Jericho and Tel Aviv. I think that's where Halon is. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're like four big families, descendants of these four big families. And the Samaritans nowadays are uh, Israeli citizens, mm -hmm. though they're very, they're very um, uh, well connected with the Palestinian peoples. So this is a story that in Jesus's day was hot to trot. I mean, mm. this is a provoking story, but that's a little bit of the historicity, the history of it and the, the locale of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and if, that's the, if that's the literal geography, uh, perhaps I might say a word about the, the spiritual geography of the story. So um, the early church fathers, the, the, the early theologians of the church really loved to turn the story into an allegory. Uh, and so people like Ambrose and Origen would say that um, the priest in the story who passes by the wounded man is the law. The mm. Levite is the prophets. And guess who's Jesus? The Samaritan. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the Samaritan, the one moved with pity for the man who's wounded upon the road. And so he stops. And who's the man wounded upon the road? But Adam. And what is the road from Jerusalem to Jericho? The road to the road of the fall of humanity. Who are the uh, who are the robbers who have beaten Adam on the way? Uh, I think it's Ambrose that says they're angels of darkness. They're the spiritual forces of wickedness which rebel against God. They are the ways of the world in the Johannine sense. Not the world is in God's creation, but the world is in everything which is opposed to God. They're the ways of the world incarnate. The manager of the stable is the church, mm -hmm. and the promise. Of the, uh, of the Samaritan to return uh, at a later time is Jesus' promise that he will come to us in the Holy Spirit and Jesus' promise for the so-called second coming. Um, a question mark there about whether it's the second coming or if you can count these comings or whatever. But anyway, uh, they have this rich allegorical meaning which they lay upon this whole story. Uh, and what I think is interesting about that is it is it opens the story up to be a, a story not just meant to provoke in its context, although certainly there. And there's a huge lesson, I think, for us, right? It's the Samaritan, this guy who would have been, um, let's just say the Samaritan, as you're saying, Peter, they would not expect for a Samaritan to be the hero of the story. They mm -hmm. would not expect for the Samaritan to be a good guy, as in mm -hmm. a guy who's doing good. Uh, and so that, there's a lesson for us, right? Uh, if Jesus was retelling the story and telling it to us to provoke us in that direction, who would Jesus make our Samaritan to be? And I actually think that that's a question worth each of us asking mm -hmm. on an individual level. Who is the person now who I think couldn't do any good at all? Who would it scandalize me if, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. if Jesus was to make them play the role of the Samaritan in the story? So there's, there's some meaning there, mm -hmm. but there's other spiritual meaning in these different characters here, if you like this, um, if you take this allegorical interpretation on, because we are like Adam. We are wounded on the road of life. And Jesus is the good Samaritan who comes to help us. And we are also sometimes, ideally so, the Samaritan, right? We are the ones who are moved with pity for our neighbor. And, uh, you know, Jesus ends this parable by telling the lawyer, go and do likewise, right? That's, that's the thing. We're all supposed to be more like the Samaritan, the unlikely, uh, you know, apparently unlikely, historically unlikely hero of this story. That we can both be the man in the ditch and the good Samaritan. And so Ambrose sums this up by saying, um, we can love Jesus as our Lord, as, in, as a Samaritan who helps us, who condescends to us, who comes down and is in the ditch with us and saves us and takes us into the church and so on and so forth. We can love him as our Lord and let us love him as our neighbor. So Ambrose is saying, let us love 
Jesus both as the one who brings us out of the ditch, like the Good Samaritan brought the wounded man out of the ditch and took care of him, and also let us love Jesus in whoever, this, whoever the wounded man is who we are passing by. May we not be like the priest and the Levite uh, who just walked by, right? Let us love Jesus who is in the ditch there. Um, he's both our Lord and our neighbor. Um, mm -hmm. That's great. I was, we were talking about Augustine and Ambrose before this, and Augustine yeah. has Which a similar... <laughs> it's very similar. Yeah. Um, Augustine's allegorical, allegorical reading would say the inn is the church, and the two denarii are the sacraments. Oh, <laughs> oh, wow. yeah. oh that's good. And so, the, the, yeah, but yes, Jesus is also the, the Samaritan, and, and we are Adam, the wounded victim on the road. Um, that's really important, I think, to, that we go right to the enemy, you know, this, this idea that um, the Samaritan isn't just a, a wounded victim, but he's an, an, I mean, not the Samaritan, the, the man on the road. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's got blood and, and guts, and, and the, the hearers of this parable are, are Jews who would find the Samaritan reprehensible and, and off-putting. Um, so we have this lawyer, this person who wants to justify himself, and he's here to test Jesus. And Jesus gives him this curveball that there's no place for this lawyer in the story. I mean, he's not... We have a victim of violence on the road and a, and a victim of racial hatred and ethnic, you know, revulsion. And that's who rescues the victim of violence. And the lawyer, you know, there's no place for him to justify himself. He's neither of these things. He's not coming from either place. And um, Jesus is almost saying, you know, you don't see your own need kind of thing, maybe. Mm -hmm. But um, I like that Jesus pushes him so far because it would be easy, and it is easy. I think in Sunday schools everywhere, we all grew up learning this story as um, do good deeds and show compassion and be a neighbor to anyone in need on the side of the road and don't be like those, you know, self-righteous priests <laughs> and Levite. And, that, and then it stops, then you know, stops. focus on the compassion. But Jesus is so radical, and it's easy to miss it that his message is really... Um, don't have enemies, and it doesn't matter who your enemies are if you're um, able to show compassion and um, cross the road, you know, not in fear and uh, avoidance, but cross the road towards the person in need and, and go meet the, the neighbor and um, go make bridges and, and show mercy and, and all that stuff. So it goes much, much further. This grown-up reading is, is way different than the Sunday school version. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, you want to talk about a mistake uh, that any lawyer could make? Trying to Just outsmart Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I, I mean, this is not a, not if you want to come out, uh, you know, with your britches in one piece. Uh, uh -huh. Jesus uh -huh. smokes the guy, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and he does it by uh, it just using him against himself, really, in the story here. And you've already said it. I mean, one of the things that, the themes that you pick up a lot in is that this is a travelogue. Jesus is on the road, and, and now we're on the road again. Mm -hmm. The quote, Willie Nelson, great song. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, on the road again, and you've pointed yeah. out that the priest and the Levite pass by on the other side, mm -hmm. and, and the Samaritan crosses the road and draws near and then by drawing near is able to see mm -hmm. then has compassion and compassion means to walk in someone else's passion mm -hmm. to walk in someone else's pain to walk in somebody else's shoes mm -hmm. and there is no doubt that um, you could spend about a week in a silent retreat on this one mm -hmm. because what Jesus does is he pushes us to the limits of how we understand love. Mm -hmm. Who do we love, right? Mm -hmm. And and so, as, as you guys know, I mean, in the, in the book of Leviticus as it is, there's an evolution in the Hebrew thinking about who is your neighbor mm -hmm. as it begins to expand from, you know, sons of Israel to to here, to here, and then Jesus takes that and just blitzes it mm -hmm. and, and tells the outrageous uh, story that, uh, that the one who shows neighborliness is the, the one who in the world there can be no neighborliness to. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so for us, we all have limits of love. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and to come in touch with that, I, I mean, we live in such, a, such an antagonistic world uh, it, it's, it's, quite, it's quite simple if you spend enough time to see where the limits of your love go mm -hmm. and, uh, and how we deal with it. 
and I'll, I'll just tell one quick vignette so we keep the conversation alive, but I remember several years ago, um, it was a summer Sunday, and I was the preacher man, and this was the topic, and I was uh, preaching about, use the word radical, I think, Jesus' radical position about nobody's on the outside, mm -hmm. right? There's nobody on the outside, and uh, somebody in our parish who writes policy statements, governmental policy statements, uh, said to me, came, came to the back of the church and was very upset. I could see it in, in her face in, uh, because I had brought up the question of sort of how does this apply to immigration? Mm -hmm. And this was at a time when uh, immigration in the United States was, you know, the leading hot button issue. And uh, so for how does one apply Jesus to immigration policy in the United States? Mm -hmm or any policy, economic policy. Mm. I mean, you name it, there's always someone who's sort of gonna fall short of the, the, yeah. the compassionate yeah. uh, limit, right? That's, that's interesting. It's totally interesting. I'm reminded of, um, of the fact that uh, Reinhold Niebuhr controversially said that the love ethic here is applicable in this world only to individuals and not to societies because he said it's impossible to apply actually to societies. It's somehow, um, when you get human beings in groups, it's straight up impossible and perhaps even unwise or imprudent to try and act in this way. And that's how, that's where you get the, you know, his philosophy was known as Christian realism. Right. Uh, and that's the, that's the realism part of it. And, um, you know, there have been many, many, many influential uh, commentators after Niebuhr who said, well, wait a minute, you just sold the social <laughs> order short, right? Perhaps we fall short of that, but, you know, uh, yeah, <laughs> we need to at least be aspiring towards it. But I have to say, I've, I've, um, I find that when you try to apply these questions, even in a personal context, they're often, often, the, store, often the answers are not straightforward. So, for example, you know, um, I have felt it a real struggle how to care for those who are in indigent or extreme poverty in our moment. Uh, and I often say things like, and I often mean them kind of flippantly, uh, you know, when I'm talking to my wife, Jewel, I'm like, well, Jesus was pretty, you know, a pretty unqualified when he talks about our, um, you know, our obligations to the poor, which I would say uh, the poor being um, not a monolithic category, but a person who's in extreme poverty, being one person who might be wounded, uh, who could be in the position now of somebody who's in the ditch, right? There are lots of ways we could be in the ditch. Being in extreme poverty in our world, I think, is one of the ways you can be in the ditch with the wounded man who's been beset upon by robbers in the story. Um, I think, you know, Jesus is pretty unqualified about what's demanded of Christians about that. You know, if somebody begs for you, begs from you, give to them. If somebody asks for your coat, give them your shoes. If somebody, this is all like the stuff in the Sermon on the, mm -hmm. on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain. And like, it's yeah. pretty uncompromising. Um, and I say, well, <laughs> sometimes I say to Jewel, well, you know, I wish Jesus had to figure out how to do this in like the tatters of the post-World War II welfare state in the state of Connecticut, where like you're supposed to call right. 211 and get in the line, and then like, you know, so you're coaching this person who's, who, who needs housing, who's on the street in Stanford, and you're like, well, call 211. And then they like, well, well 211 says that um, uh, I'm on a waiting list. And then you're like, you're on a waiting list? What do you mean you're on a waiting list? And then you call 211, they're like, yeah, there's a waiting list. You, know, you have to go through this process and this process and this process, and there's a, anyway, it's just wildly complicated, actually, to help people. I wish it was this simple. I wish it was as simple, and at some level it is as simple, right? At some level, at some level, I, at some level it is as simple, right? And I, I'm not, um, I actually counsel people, if somebody asks you for money, just give it to them. I'm kind of in the Pope Francis sort of uh, scheme of things when it comes to, um, when it comes to people who um, are soliciting money if they're housing insecure and they're on the street. I'm kind of like, no, just give them money, right? I know, I kind of know what the right answer is for that. I don't always know what the right answer is like helping a person from the street into housing, into a secure life, et cetera. The roads are so circuitous. This is before you enter into any of the complex uh, issues around this person's, um, people's mental health, their family circumstances, their career circumstances, and so on. It's unbelievably complicated to help people. Um, and that's where I become very sympathetic, actually, to the Niburian position. I really want 
for the moral life, even just the care of the poor is just one example, to be as simple as, well, they're on the side of the road, they're in trouble, I'm going to help them. My question has often been, how can I help them most effectively? Because I'll say, I've been in some circumstances where I have just helped people, and I'm actually not sure that it was to their benefit in the long run. They actually needed to be helped by somebody who wasn't me. They needed to be helped by somebody from a shelter in Norwalk. They actually didn't need for Father Justin to be helping them. Mm -hmm. It's very, very complicated. That's where I get sympathetic to Niebuhr. The world's just a complicated place. Well, oh, amen to that. I mean, this is the question of the post-lapsarian world, right? What happened at the fall? How did a good thing get so complicated? And, and anybody, I mean, you've, you've touched on some things about uh, social service networks. Boy, if, if dialing 211 worked, wouldn't that be amazing? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't. Uh, and and we, have, we have all sorts of, of people in trauma. The social safety net in, our, in, our, in the state of Connecticut has a lot of holes in it. I hate to be fishing with that net because the fish are all getting through the net. Uh, but I, I think that, um, that, that Jesus, the uncompromising Jesus, uh, Jesus is, he's so clear and always so clear and always beyond us, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so let's just take the question of, mm -hmm. uh, speaking of the, the Sermon on the Plain in Luke or Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, do not judge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a great example. Okay. Keep going. I, I mean, that sounds amazing, but when you go to apply it, it gets mm -hmm. incredibly complicated, given that we judge all the time. I, I mean, we mm -hmm. judge the stereotyping without ceasing. Our, our brains mm -hmm. prepare for this. I've been reading this incredible article uh, from the Neurological Institute of Columbia about how somebody hits a pro baseball. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to make your decision when the ball's that far from a finger and the guy's, mm -hmm. the ball's going 100 miles an hour. How do you know where to swing? Mm -hmm. And it's this anticipation from the mind because it's seen so many pitches. And so we, mm -hmm. we anticipate, we judge, we judge, we judge. Mm -hmm. But I think that what, what Jesus is doing with this, in my mind, is that Jesus is dismantling. This is a statement to dismantle, not about mantle. Mm -hmm. And so he is dismantling uh, the, the personal constructions that we have for, for uh, personal safety. And, uh, and he is opening us to think as God thinks. Mm -hmm. And so the disposition of the heart, uh, the basic disposition of Jesus is let go. I mean, we have, uh, I mean, if we were gonna try to sum up uh, his, his moral teachings, half of it has to do with let go of all of your predispositions and then follow the way of love. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in our own growth as human beings, in our own spiritual journeys, it seems to me that uh, if we are attentive to, uh, attentive to the way of love, if we're attentive to our Lord, what we see is this constant banging in to the limits of our predispositions. Mm. And if we're listening with the gospel with our soul and not just with our head, and we, so you have, I mean, you can listen to the gospel with your head and come up with a lot of theories. You can listen with your heart and be moved, but not know how to apply it. If you listen to the gospel with your soul, you go, holy smokes, the guy's on another plane. I need to move toward that plane. And I can't solve all of this, but if I can change my disposition, I might be able to change that which I come in contact with. And so mm -hmm. Francis mm -hmm. heard all of this stuff mm -hmm. and he abandoned the head, he abandoned the heart and he moved to the way of the soul. And, he, mm -hmm. and then if so Francis had that, that kind of crystal clarity, like, mm -hmm. oh, Jesus said to this, I'm just going to do it. And it, and it blew everybody apart. Mm -hmm. And in the, you know, by the time the second generation Franciscans come along, they can't do it, right? I mean, he's mm -hmm. angry with them all over the place right. because they start to mantle around and say, this isn't Christian realism, this isn't Franciscan realism. We actually need to do things. We want to start a university. Francis is like, oh, you know, it's a university. No, 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 that's not what Jesus, Jesus didn't say anything about starting a university kind mm -hmm. of thing. Yeah. And so I think that the teaching for us, I think the real energy of Jesus is, can we eat the scroll? Mm -hmm. Can we actually <laughs> put the teachings of Jesus into our being. Mm -hmm. And that is about the most exciting and yeah. petrifying thing in the world, mm -hmm. which is actually to start to contend with what he has mm -hmm. to say. Mm -hmm. But you can only get there through the movement of the yeah. Spirit. This is not something you can do on your own. Right. If the Holy Spirit is not with you, forget about it. Right. It ain't happening because we'll remantle. Right. It takes the Spirit to dismantle. Right. Jesus is the original metaverse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't even right? know what that means. Oh, well, wow. I have to think about Well, I mean, he really, he went 
beyond, it's not about the results. He mm -hmm. was not driven by, you know, outcomes. He wasn't healing every person he ever saw. He wasn't um, solving for the things that you're scratching your head about and, and Niebuhr worried about. He was in the business of transformation of every human heart, one by one, transforming the way people see. You know, for him, religion was a way of seeing, not a way of um, accomplishing mm. or keeping to rules or, or what have you. And I think you're, I'm, I'm with what you're saying quite, quite a bit. And I think that he challenges this lawyer who wants to find a rule to follow or not. Mm. But he, he challenges Jesus to say, you know, lay down the parameters for me because I want to do what I can to move into your kingdom. But there's not a manual for it. I mean, to, to move in, the kingdom has to move into him, like you've said, you know. And I yeah. think that um, he, uh, Jesus is just like turning over the man's mindset and everybody listening, including ours, that um, we, too ca we just can't be driven by outcomes. And it, it isn't really about that. And Jesus himself said, the poor will always be with you. And um, we don't have an out to not try to help every person and to try to change the systems that aren't adequate to, to house the homeless and stuff. We don't have an out, but once we are, you know, transformed and, and become these, these people who, whose whole way of being is limitless compassion, we can't not vote a certain way or do a certain thing, like to change systems because that's, it comes out of who we are. You know, I mean, there, there wouldn't be a limit on possibility of, of helping, even if it's unattainable. I mean, mm -hmm. all the mystics, all the great rabbis say, do what you can, not what you can't. You know, we're not all guilty. We're all responsible for the repair of the world. Yeah, I do love that Hebrew thing about the repair of the world. But I, I'm interested in, in this one with you because uh, we're, we have a moment of, of, of Jesus, in some sense, trans, transformation of law into gospel. Mm -hmm. And I'm not denigrating law at all. I'm not, mm -hmm. and there's no denigration here, but as, as we might, might think of, of, of sort of perspectives or dispositions and looks at what's happening here. Jesus, Jesus is a Jewish man talking to a Jewish lawyer here. I mean, they're talking about the same thing mm -hmm. here, right? We're, they're talking about Deuteronomy and Leviticus. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what they're having a conversation. It's, mm -hmm. it's a lawyer and a rabbi, basically Jesus is a rabbi, yeah. uh, and, and the law of the gospel. But you've, you know, one of the things you've been so um, articulate with in our community mm -hmm. is that we can be people with the same Jesus disposition, mm -hmm. and then we can disagree mm -hmm. about how you get there. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, this is in the conversation oh, about yeah, yeah. many different uh, things. Completely right, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and the, I think we would do the story a real disservice if we turned the, if we turned the, the priest of the Levite into the Samaritan right. of our day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. If we, had, if we thought about the priest of the Levite <laughs> in the same way that the lawyer is ostensibly going to think about the Samaritan in this story, right, which is an unfortunate <laughs> consequence of, mm -hmm. of many of Jesus' polemics which are all intra-Jewish in his context, right? Mm -hmm. But we read them, uh, you know, when you, when you read them in a Christian context, uh, you know, you can, you can forget that. And, mm -hmm. and yeah. you, can, you, can, um, uh, you can let the polemic run away from you and forget that this is an intra-Jewish conversation. And, and mm -hmm. so there's a way of reading this particular passage as being like, a, you know, um, you got the priest and the Levites, and the priest and the Levites are people whose job is to make sacrifices. That's mm -hmm. their, reli their, their religious job. people. Yeah. That's their job. Uh, so the, you know, uh, the priests are descendants of Aaron, Aaron, uh, brother of Moses, Moses and Aaron and their sister Miriam are all part of the tribe of Levi. And so Moses appoints Aaron the priest and uh, it says that all of Aaron's descendants are going to be the priests. So all the priests are descendants of Aaron. It's a genealogical, it's a hereditary job. It's not like, you know, you go and you discern priesthood with your, with your community or whatever. It's when you're born a priest because you're in the, in the line of Aaron. And then the mm -hmm. Levites are all the other members of the tribe of Levi. Mm -hmm. And they're basically the ancestors of what in the Episcopal Church we call acolytes. So they, they, uh, they, they, they serve at they serve in the temple, assist the, assist the priests with the making of sacrifices and so on. And you could mm -hmm. say that like, well, you got, you, got, you got the era of sacrifice and the era of sacrifice passes by the guy in need. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the era of love and love is not sacrifice. That's too simple because actually love is a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And that's, the, that's one of the interpretations of sacrifice in the, in the New Testament. Hebrews is really very, um, you know, Hebrews is at the front of my mind here, uh, but also the book of Ephesians. Um, 
one of my one of the most well-known lines in the Episcopal Church is um, Ephesians five two because it's an it's an option for um, it's an option for the the offertory sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, Walk in love as Christ mm -hmm. loved us and gave Himself up for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that the walking in this way of love is a sacrifice, the self-giving love. So it, it's, it's not that sacrifices passed and by, now we don't have any sacrifices. Mm -hmm. It's now that these sacrifices have been caught up in, they've been completed, they have achieved what is be, what was always beyond them, but somehow, in, somehow implicit in them, mm -hmm. in the love of Jesus, and then we're supposed to walk in that love too. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing that I, I think is important about this passage that helps us, it doesn't let us off the hook, it just puts us in perspective. And I really like what you guys were saying about, you know, the, the, the real spiritual job is to eat the scroll, to take the spirit of Jesus in, and then let yourself be transformed, and, and then you're being transformed, you walk around in the world, you, you participate in the transforming of the world. But it's not your job to fix everything. The lawyer is trying to justify himself. That's... That's mm -hmm. what it says. Mm -hmm. Wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Mm -hmm. right. And Jesus tells him the story and says, go and do likewise. But I don't think that that was, I don't think Jesus is telling him, here's how you justify yourself. Right. I think he's saying, this is the way of love. This is the new sacrifice. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. the way of love that is my own being. Mm -hmm. And if you take me in, if you take my spirit in, then by the power of my spirit, you can live this redeemed life. But it's not a do-gooder story. This is the difference. Right. This is the Sunday school version versus the adult version. Mm -hmm. It's not just a recipe for do-gooding. Mm -hmm. It's a recipe to be transformed. Because the, um, you know, I, I, speaking of law and gospel, I really love the old reformed, uh, some of the old reformed language. Um, I've had the pleasure of spending some time recently with Fleming Rutledge, who's a friend of a parishioner mm -hmm. here. Uh, and, um, and Fleming Rutledge is a big fan of this stuff too. And one of her catchphrases is, I think it's from Newbingen, but I can't remember. Uh, sorry, she'll have to correct me on Twitter. Um, and uh, uh, Newbingen, I think, says something like, um, uh, what we're all looking for is the simultaneous realization that we cannot do it ourselves with the realization that it has already been done for us. <laughs> and that's the <laughs> magic of grace. That's the... Uh, uh, that's the fact you don't have to justify yourself actually all you're supposed to do is just receive the gift of the spirit and then let the spirit work inside of you let the spirit do what the spirit's going to do it's actually not letting you off the hook it's both as you put it it's um exciting and petrifying mm -hmm. but it's not about us and who we think is in or out it's not even about us at all i don't think mm -hmm. except so far as we're instruments of the spirit people who god can put to good use mm -hmm. Wow, thanks to both of you. You said incredible things. I think we, we could wrap this one up and let the people ruminate over yeah. this incredible richness. Uh, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you in church on Sunday. Please like, share, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.